morning. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is the final volunteer tutoring classroom made webinar series of the spring. So we will be taking the summer off and we'll have um, the next one starting in September. Um, if you would like um, to view the recordings for any of these, they are in the portal, or if you go to the PA Adult Ed Resources website, which I'll put in the chat in a moment here, um, there's a link there to view recordings for any of the sessions that you might want to review, or if you have missed any of them that you were interested in. Um, okay, Rose, we'll go to the next slide. Alrighty. So today, uh, Rose Joya Fine is going to be um, talking to us about supporting their success through a trauma-informed approach. Um, so this is one of Rose's many areas of expertise and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. So uh, with that, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much, Rachel. Appreciate the opportunity to be uh, here today. Welcome everyone. First, I want to say a big thank you to you uh, for your service to the learners in Pennsylvania. Truly appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I also want to thank you for your interest in supporting those learners. And today we're going to be taking a look at what support might look like through a trauma-informed approach. My name is Rose Joya Fine. Uh, as Rachel said, I work at the Tuscarora Intermediate Unit. My role there is the manager of innovation and special projects. So I have a lot of really interesting different kinds of things that I do each day. Um, I have 30 years of experience working with adult learners, with families and children in a variety of different settings. And I began my career um, as a tutor. And it's one of those things which I'm sure you've discovered already is that you fall in love with the students and the learners. And um, I've just stayed here all that time. Uh, I also have my own trauma story that I've been able to integrate and resolve some of my own trauma. So I bring that experience to the topic as well. Um, I invite you to keep your camera on, to use the chat, to open your mic. Um, this is a big topic for just a little bit of time. So today it'll sound a lot like me talking, but I really wanna invite you to uh, ask questions that you might have or uh, put things in the chat. So since there's just a small group of us at the moment, I would love for you to unmute your mic if you feel comfortable and just let me know your name, sort of where you are in Pennsylvania and um, the kind of tutoring that you're involved with. So uh, let's take a, a minute or two. If we could just give you a second to think about what you wanna say and then whoever wants to go first, just open your mic and say hello. Anyone? I'm, mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm uh, Janet Asbury and I'm from Pittsburgh and I, um, uh, I tutor an ESL student uh, from, um, from Moldova. Uh, I'm working with uh, Literacy Pittsburgh, but I'm also in a graduate program to uh, teach TESOL. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. It's so nice to meet you. And who knows, you might be, I'm in Pittsburgh too. So <laughs> who knows, you might be real close to me. Great. All right. Who would like to go next? I'll go next. My well, name you. is Lisa, Lisa Morse. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the program coordinators at Literacy Pittsburgh. Um, like you, Rose, I started as a volunteer tutor um, a number of years ago. Um, I'm K through 12 ESL certified. Um, and when I decided that wasn't the route I was going to travel, I turned towards adult ed and mm -hmm. haven't really looked back. <laughs> um, so I, my job right now is matching tutors and students. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like I have the best of both worlds. I get to see both, mm -hmm. both sides of the, the issue. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Lisa. So nice to meet you. Patrick, would you like to go next? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, Julie. Thanks. Hi, I'm Julie Shepard. I am a tutor also from Literacy Pittsburgh. 
Rose, I think you and I met many years ago to talk about family literacy. Mm-hmm. Good to meet I'm you again, Julie. Still plucking along. Nice to see you too. <laughs> I am. I work uh, full time for the Pittsburgh Promise. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the students that we work with are students who have been involved in some sort of trauma informed backgrounds. Uh, so I'm actually looking at this seminar as being something that brings my my daytime job together with my volunteer work. And I think they just all cycle together. So I appreciate all that you're offering. Thanks, Julie. Great to see you. You too. Patrick, would you like to go now? Yeah, yeah. good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. I, I see I'm vastly outnumbered by people from Pittsburgh. I happen to be in, <laughs> in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, I've, I've been a volunteer through the Lancaster Lebanon Literacy Council for about four or five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last three years, I've been more or less stationed at Um, an educational building run by the Spanish American Civic Association here in in Lancaster. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Very active, worthwhile, um, powerful organization in in southeastern Pennsylvania. And they have an educational building called Tech Centro. I teach um, ESL to primarily adult Latinx students and uh, but a lot of other things go on in that organization. It's a workforce development organization and it's just a, a, a fine organization and I'm happy to be affiliated with them. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. We'd like to go next. Hello. Mm-hmm. Hi, my name is Rachel Hubbs and I am an adult volunteer tutor to two ELL students from Venezuela. Um, also during the school year, I teach eighth grade English full time. Mm-hmm. So English mm-hmm. could apply to to either of those positions. Thanks, Rachel. So nice to meet you. So we have a couple more who haven't introduced. If you'd like to, uh, I'll go. Mm-hmm. Um, my name's Julie Bianco. I'm uh, in the Pittsburgh area. I am. Uh, uh, I volunteer in an informal ESL program Mm -hmm. with um, Afghanis, and I have been an ESL teacher for about five years now. I worked in um, South Carolina um, Mm -hmm. with a lot of refugees from all over the world and immigrants coming in from all over the world as well. So this, I haven't been directly, but I think I've been around like trauma victims, I guess, mm-hmm. of, you know, refugees coming out of really bad situations. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm very interested in this. Thank you, Julie. Good to meet you. Kelly? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kelly Zayago. I'm with Chester County OIC, so on the mm-hmm. other side, Pennsylvania. And I'm an ESL instructor and the IHPES at my organization. Um, but I train the volunteer classroom aides, and mm-hmm. this is a topic that I'm interested in and hoping to become more adept at when training new classroom mm-hmm. aides. So I'm excited to be here. Oh, thank you. Christine, would you like to go next? I think you might be on mute, Christine. Christine also introduced herself in the chat earlier. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. So for those of you who can't see it, if you joined after she posted it, it says, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Christine R. Muller. I'm a volunteer ESL tutor for the CSIU's adult education program in Lewisburg, PA. Okay, great. Great to meet you. And so I think we have Cindy. Yeah. Good morning. Um, So I'm a volunteer tutor at Beyond Literacy in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I have absolutely no background in teaching. I spent 40 years as an occupational therapist and I retired and I wanted to do something meaningful with my time. So um, 
tutoring reading to people that are pre-GED. Mm -hmm. So well, they need you. like a lot more attention and, uh, you know, they just need pretty much to practice reading. Since then, I've gotten the STAR training. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, trying to get a little bit more competent uh, because I do, I found that I really, really like doing this. Great. So, um, yeah, so, and the trauma thing has been a particular personal interest of mine. I've been taking classes in somatic therapy and mm -hmm. things. So, um, yeah, having this, these two things come together is, is really interesting for me. Oh, great. So nice to meet you. And thank you. Yeah, thank for you for service. doing this. Oh, absolutely. Happy to do it. I'm not sure why this is. Oh, there we go. Okay, so in this little bit of time that we have together, um, we're going to try to touch on some of these things. And what we hope to really take a look at is that you'll have a definition of trauma when we're finished, and that you have some ideas of how we might start to incorporate trauma-informed care into the work that we're doing, uh, some strategies to support your learners, and I would ask that you, as we're thinking through all of this, that if you can maybe just pull out one thing that you might explore more deeply when we're done or try to incorporate into the tutoring that you're doing. Uh, so if we can just all walk away with one thing today, uh, one new knowledge or one new thing that we're willing to try, uh, I'm gonna call it a, a good day for all of us. So what I'd like you to do first, I have two things on the screen here that I would ask that you uh, reflect on one of them. You might wanna jot this down somewhere because we're gonna reflect on this again. But what I'd like you to do is to reflect on a time when either a learner that you were working with behaved in a way that you couldn't understand or explain. So think about that and how did that situation make you feel and what kinds of things were you thinking? So that would be your first choice of reflection. The other one would be to reflect back to the most challenging situation either you faced as a tutor or that you can imagine as a tutor involving the behavior of one of your learners. How did you handle it? Or how did you wish you would have handled it? So I'll give you two minutes just to sort of reflect on that and uh, jot down a couple of uh, thoughts that you have related to those. All right, in about 30 seconds, we're going to come back together. Okay, when we do this reflection, sometimes some things that come up for people are some of the examples might be um, a student not showing up on time, perhaps a student being quite ready and prepared to take the GED exam and all systems are go and ready to make that happen. And then on the day of the test, they don't come. Um, sometimes not being 100% truthful is something that comes up here. Uh, a lot of different things that you could be thinking of. But as these things are coming up, what I want you to think about as we move forward and we learn more about trauma is some of these behaviors that we can't explain or that we think about all kinds of different explanations in our mind that come to the reasons why we think things are happening. These things could be a trauma response for someone. And we'll hear more about trauma response, but I want you to sort of keep that in mind uh, as we revisit the reflection at the end. So oftentimes when we hear trauma, 
what we think about is an isolated incident, perhaps uh, an event like a, a car crash or a serious illness or someone passing away. And while these are traumatic events, the trauma itself refers to how someone experiences the event or the series of events or whatever happens. Um, and two people can experience the exact same traumatic event, but come out of it quite differently and experience that trauma in a different way or not at all. So what we have here on the screen is the definition of trauma. So I would ask if someone would open up their mic and read that definition for us, if you don't mind. Would someone be willing to do that? Individual trauma results from an event series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical social emotional or spiritual well-being okay so what we want to think about there there's a lot of key words there that it is really how it's experienced by a person and two people can experience the exact same event and uh, take it on in, a, in an entirely different way. So when the body responds, so as humans, our brains and our bodies are really um, geared toward looking for threat and then responding to threats. And what we do in those situations is uh, one of three things usually. It's a flight, a fight, or a freeze. And back when there were threats constantly upon us, like the saber-toothed tiger coming after us, we really had to be hypervigilant and in the state of flight, fight, or freeze often. What happens to folks who experience a traumatic event and then have the resulting trauma is they can get stuck in that fight, flight, or freeze. So when there's not a, an immediate threat upon them, they still may be acting as if there is. So um, the body and the mind both are, are experiencing trauma. So trauma is something that is very prevalent in our society. And when we think about trauma or the event that sort of uh, comes before uh, someone experiences trauma, something, one of these things uh, is usually something that we think that happened. So what I want you to think about in trauma is think about yourself and also think about the learners that you work with. Are you working with folks who have experienced any of these kinds of things? So uh, on your, we're gonna try something and this doesn't always work, but let's try it. Uh, on your toolbar that you have for your Zoom, you might be seeing something that says annotate. Is anybody seeing that? If you see annotate, what I'd like you to do is to click on it. And that brings a toolbar to the top of your screen. Is anyone seeing that? Okay, so what you do, I'm seeing some head shaking. So what I want you to do there is go up to where it says stamp. If you're not seeing, it's okay. If you don't have the annotate, it's all right. But if Rose, you do, yes. Rose, they need to look under view options. Okay, if they open oh, view thank you. Options, then then annotates like the third one down. Oh, is that a voice I'm familiar with? That's Lynn. Yes, it is. Hi, Hi Lynn, how are you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so under view options, you should have this stamp. So you can choose the stamp that you want, the star or the heart or whatever. But what I would ask you to do is to think and reflect about your students or yourself and put a star or a stamp, whatever you're choosing, down on the box that you, as many boxes as you think, that your learners may have experienced some of this. And again, uh, many of us have experienced these kinds of things as well. So um, you can put for yourself or one of your learners. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of stamps there, right? Yeah. So that's really giving us some indication of how prevalent trauma is. 
But there was a study, and you may have heard of this study before. It's called the ACES study. A lot of folks um, are hearing more about it. But ACES stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And in 1995, the CDC and Kaiser Permanente did this study. It was actually a study on a whole different, uh, they were looking at it for a whole different reason, but they studied 17,000 people in Southern California and they asked them about their early childhood experiences related to these kinds of things. And what they found in that study was that 61% of uh, the participants in that study had experienced at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. And what the study showed was that there was a high correlation to having experienced these kinds of adverse childhood experiences and health risks and behavior risks. And over time, this study has been done differently and in different communities and they have even added things to what people are experiencing. So uh, in, they actually did one, I know we have somebody from Philadelphia here, but the study in Philadelphia added a couple other things, which were seeing a dead body in the street and also seeing someone overdose. So over time, they really are trying to figure out how these prevalences of these kinds of experiences are causing trauma which are then related to uh, these kinds of things that we're seeing adverse uh, health experiences and behavior outcomes. So just by looking at what you have here, we know in with the students in Pennsylvania that we're working with, uh, these kinds of things are very, very uh, prevalent. And you can look up the ACEs study. You can actually take a quiz for yourself. Back in 1995, the results with those 17,000 people showed that um, 61% had experienced one of these, uh, at least one of these traumatic events, but what they're, the research is showing now is at least 87%. So almost anyone that we run into are people that we're working with, we know that they probably have had some sort of trauma. So the more that we can be aware of this and aware of how trauma has impacted our own lives, the, uh, the more tools that we can, can have to work with others. So we're gonna clear that out. Thank you so much. And we will continue. So let's clear that couple hearts still there. Clear, oh, there we go. Okay, all right. Um, so when we're talking about trauma, it's really important that we realize the impact of trauma on marginalized communities uh, is even greater. So folks who have experienced oppression, discrimination, violence, uh, folks who have experienced and who are refugee families and adults, folks who've gone through the pandemic, you know, those are uh, the impact on health and behavior and are even more magnified. So with, I've heard it said that, you know, we're all in a similar storm, but we are in different kinds of boats and that's true. So what you wanna remember is that folks who are in marginalized communities have experienced uh, a greater impact from trauma. So what that ACEs study showed uh, related to these early childhood experiences were the behaviors that are impacted and the outcomes. So take a look at the, the left side there with the behaviors uh, and think about the learners that you're working with. Uh, how much of this has disrupted their education, do you think? The learners that you are working with, um, are you, do you think they have experienced these behaviors? Probably quite a few. Right? So that's, that's something that they're seeing with behaviors, but then look at the right side of how these ACEs affect the outcomes for them and these health outcomes. So what happens when we are in working with folks and sometimes things are happening that we're not exactly sure uh, why they're behaving the way they are, why they're making the choices the way they are, sometimes we jump to conclusions and in our society, we have a tendency to blame folks for the situations that we're in. 
But what the ACEs study has shown us in all these years is that there's usually underlying trauma response, underlying trauma that is driving a lot of this. And uh, it's important to know that. So related to school, and school performance, a traumatized children, take a look here. This makes sense, right? As to why so many students at, who are traumatized end up leaving school and end up in programs that you are so uh, working with. So uh, the suspended and expelled from school. So, so often our response over time to folks who have experienced trauma are not helpful, right? I had a student who he uh, had lost his mother over the summer during school. His mother had passed away and he had gone to live with an aunt and he had gone to a new school. So that fall, he was in a new school setting and he was in a, uh, a biology class and he shared this story and it's stories like this and stories from folks who have really experienced the effects of when we don't understand trauma uh, what happens. So he was in uh, a class and the, the person next to him was someone who didn't know him that well, but they were, you know, in the eighth grade and they were young students. And he uh, said something, you know how kids can be. He said something negative about the boy's mother. He didn't know the boy, he didn't know the boy's mother. He didn't know the story, but he said uh, something very negative and rude about the mother. And my student uh, told me that what he did was he flipped the table and things went everywhere and he went after the student. So what happened was he was called into the office and it was of course uh, a zero tolerance violent school. So they were going to suspend and expel him. The principal of the school at that time understood trauma, understood what had happened and knew his story. So he was able to make an exception to that. And what Darian, my student said to me, um, I had taught him in a college course. And what he said to me was, that was a, a turning point in his life where it could have gone two ways. He could have either gone um, and gotten suspended and who knows expelled what road that would have taken. But because he found someone who understood trauma who was in a position of power, who could make an exception and identify what was happening. And the principal wasn't a therapist, but he was someone who could be helpful. So he connected him to resources that um, could help him. And he ended up getting a master's degree eventually and helping other people. So while in the role that we have as, as folks who are supporting learners, we're not therapists. We can't change what happened to them. We can't control situations but we are in a helping relationship. So the more our toolbox has uh, tools in it to help us recognize trauma and to set up situations that are trauma informed, which we'll hear about in a few minutes what we can do. That's the part that we can play. So the more knowledge we have about these kinds of things and the more um, ways that we can incorporate them into the work that we're working with people, the better. So I applaud that you're interested in this topic um, and because it's impacting a lot of people. So in your role as tutor, how does this show up? Like how do you recognize when someone may be, uh, some of the struggles that they're having are related to the trauma that they've experienced? Well, some of the impacts on learning that you might see is students may have a difficult time organizing narrative material. So writing an essay may be really, really difficult for someone who has experienced trauma. Uh, in their life, they may, there has ne maybe never been much order or there may have been a lot of chaos and you only know what you know. So organizing a narrative in a clear way may be something that's very difficult. Impact on learning, understanding cause and effect. Um, folks who've come from a traumatic background and experienced trauma, there usually isn't a clear link between cause and effect. And if there is, it's often uh, a negative cause and effect. Taking another 
person's perspective, uh, paying attention can be very, very difficult, being able to focus. Because if you remember that trauma brain is in that fight, flight, or freeze. Um, regulating emotions, that's very, very difficult. So you may have someone who flies off the handle very easily that you're working with, or someone who shuts down. It's coming from the trauma. The idea of the executive functioning skills, those uh, are very, very difficult for so folks. That's that idea of self-control, uh, focusing, paying attention, doing the kinds of things that in order to learn uh, need to be adjusted or we need to be presenting things in a different way so that they can uh, grab onto it and learn differently. Engaging in the curriculum. Another example about this, uh, depending on what the curriculum is and what their trauma comes from, sometimes a curriculum or a lesson or a study can be a trigger. I worked with a student who was having um, anxiety and depression. Something had triggered that back from an early trauma and uh, she was really struggling in her, I think it was the 11th grade literature or some kind of an English class. But when we took a look at what was happening, uh, they were studying in cold blood in that class. And, you know, so met with the teacher, talked to her about, could we have uh, some, maybe a different reading for the person? And you know, the teacher's response was, well, you know, the, the youth today, they really like criminal minds and these kinds of investigative ID and these kinds of shows. So that's why we're, you know, we're reading these kinds of things. Um, so a trauma-informed approach to that would have been to giving the, 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 the class a choice of maybe a couple of different books to read from, because reading that curriculum was a trigger for prior trauma for the student. And again, we don't ever know what people are bringing, and we can't uh, anticipate every story, and we are going to make mistakes in some of the things that we do. But one of the big things about a trauma-informed approach is that there's invitation and there's also choice. So in the language that we're using and the things that we are providing folks to do, that we incorporate those kinds of things. If you notice, whenever I said hello this morning and, and welcomed you, I invited you to keep your camera on. I didn't say you must keep your camera on, right? So um, just small things like that can make a big difference for someone who's experienced trauma. Some of the trauma response behaviors that come up and we'll see and think back, you know, to that student that you reflected on or that incident that you reflected on this um, earlier this morning um, were some of these behaviors coming up. But before we go to the trauma response behaviors, I wanna give you an opportunity to ask a question, open your mic now, um, share a thought, anything. And it's a big topic and we don't, you know, we're just scratching the surface of it. But yes, someone was opening their mic. Hi, Rose. It's Julie. Yes. I, on the flip side, uh, I was thinking of, you know, the student who was so triggered by that one reading. Yes. I also found that with my student who has a number of issues that she's dealing with, mm -hmm. that a reading that felt more positive to her was very freeing. Mm -hmm. So we read at one point, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And for her, that was, she just embraced that perspective. So, you know, finding something that they respond to can be just as powerful, if not more so than something that they kind of, withdraw from. Yeah, absolutely, Julie. It can be a tool. And mm -hmm. that comes to knowing your student well, right? Knowing what they're interested in. And yes, reading, reading can really um, be freeing for some folks, for sure. I talked to someone yesterday who was sharing how the Harry Potter books 
uh, even though those last few uh, were dark, they were going through a rough time and that was helpful to them. Yeah, so we never know, right? But getting to know the student and as many uh, tools we have, the better. So thank you, Julie, thanks for sharing that. Anybody else? Okay, so the way trauma response behaviors show up, reactivity, impulsivity, aggression, defiance, withdrawal. And you see, these are things that could, that could get folks removed from some educational settings, right? I'm glad they're in a safe space with all of you um, where you're understanding some of these responses for sure. The bottom one, perfectionism, is often very surprising for folks to see here. And it's often the, the, the learner who shows up uh, with perfectionism who sometimes needs even more help um, than the folks who are acting out and aggressive or defiant or whatever withdrawing. So that's something you wanna keep on your radar that um, the person who's working really, really, really hard to do every, everything right and who gets really upset um, when they're not able to do that, um, could that could be a trauma response. So the trauma-informed approach, the things that we want to be aware of, again, because, you know, again, we're not therapists, but we're in therapeutic, helpful relationships with people where things that we can do uh, can make a difference. So sometimes we call these the four R's, but these are things that uh, you want to think about. And one is really just realizing how prevalent trauma is and helping folks to understand whether it's ourselves. I mean, we may be the ones who have experienced the trauma and need to try to integrate and resolve it. Um, but realizing it's widespread and understanding that there are paths to recovery and most hurts happen within a relationship. So healing takes place within a relationship. And most of you are probably doing tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, maybe some small groups, but that's a real chance to get to know people differently. Um, asking powerful questions, really getting to know them um, helps with this realizing how widespread trauma can be. Uh, the second R is recognizing what the signs and the symptoms of trauma can be just sort of making aware. Now we're not diagnosing, we're not predicting, you know, none of those things, but we're just being aware of when we might see it. And some of those things that you might see, that flight, fight, and freeze shows up uh, a lot in different ways. And all of us, you know, at some point are in that, but when you see it constantly, you're coming up over and over. There's something called the zone of tolerance. And that's um, was a theory that came up by a man named Dan Siegel. <clears throat> and what that means is there's like a zone where we're in the, the place where we're feeling calm and relaxed enough to, uh, to learn well. But what we see in trauma is at the very, it's sort of at the tippy top, um, the hypervigilance, where people are agitated, they're unable to sit still, they're unable to focus, um, they're reactive, they have a, a easy startle response. That's that, uh, that's that trauma response happening. And then at the other end of that is where people sort of disassociate, they check out, they're not engaged. So what we try to do is help folks move closer to the, uh, that zone where, uh, the zone of tolerance where we are, the trauma's not gone away, but we've found ways to uh, integrate, resolve. Uh, and there are lots of ways to do that. One of, one of us who introduced ourselves today talked about somatic or body training, body therapy. There are things, um, that you can help students learn to do that help bring them back into the zone. If someone is hyper vigilant, sometimes all they need to do is do something physical to stand up when they're learning, to walk out and look at a window when we're asking them to concentrate and learn. Uh, if we incorporate and we see some of that's happening, we just say, hey, let's take a break. Let's, let's look out the window. Um, touch is really another tool 
that can help bring people back to the zone, which is uh, soothing, self-soothing for themselves. Um, another thing, if, if someone is sort of checking out or sort of disassociated, if they clap, tap, you know, there's lots of, um, lots of, of ways to help people cope and to bring them to the zone. So the first R is realizes, the second is recognizing, and the third one is responds. And that's, um, this is bigger, this is more systemic, but this is the idea of when we have knowledge about trauma-informed uh, approaches, we integrate them into our policies, into our procedures and our practices. The example that I shared with you about Darian who had a principal who was able to say, yes, we have this policy of zero tolerance, but we're gonna need to make an exception to that in this case. Um, and recognizing that zero tolerance, you know, those kinds of policies, they came about for a reason, but um, do they really work? And then the fourth R is that re-traumatizing, really resisting re-traumatizing. So, that's and that's happened to folks over and over again because our systems are set up in a in a specific way especially our traditional school systems that reinforce some of that trauma for sure so remembering the four r's and creating as many uh trauma sensitive learning environments as we can uh, and remembering that supportive relationships are key people who have experienced trauma are very much in tune to the energy of other people and how people respond and react to them. And um, they can pick up on if someone is disappointed in them. So uh, the more that you know about recognizing the signs and the symptoms and just in your role, being a supportive person who is aware and has some tools in, in, in your toolkit to, uh, to set up these kinds of environments. Things like choice, things like, uh, I mean, you're probably still doing uh, a lot of virtual um, tutoring maybe. If you're in person, things like lighting can make a big difference for someone or letting people know when you're gonna change from one thing to another. If you notice in the beginning when I had you do the reflection activity, <laughs> I told you when we had 30 seconds left before we wouldn't come together. Small things, while they sound or seem like really uh, minor, and can they really make a difference? They really do make a difference for someone. The language that we use. Um, I was talking to a trans student, and I, a student who was trans, and I said, I really want to try to make this environment safe for you. And what the person said to me was, I appreciate that. The best you can do is make the environment safer for me. I feel safe nowhere, is what the student said to me. So, wow, what a learning moment for me, right? Just the difference between the word safe and safer. So I tried to learn as much as I could about, um, about the language related to uh, the trauma-informed approach. And again, are we going to get it right every time? We're not, and that's okay. But people are forgiving, they'll understand that. But as much as we can do to be mindful of those four R's and remember that we are support for them. So here are some of the strategies. Uh, I'll stop before I go to the strategies. Does anybody have a, a question or a comment? There's lots of resources out here. I'm gonna give Rachel some great videos and some other things for you um, that when you have time, you can take a look at because it's, it's a big, big topic, right? So some of the strategies, and this is probably the, one of the most important strategies of all is to really know yourself. Be self-reflective. If you need supports, if you notice some of this with one of your students, I know it's a team approach, there's an instructor, there's, I'm going to say case manager for lack of a better word, but a student success person or someone else in your organization, ask for support for folk, from folks, uh, either for yourself or for the students that you're um, working with. Uh, the next one is practice cultural humility. And 
Some of you may have heard of that word before, some not. You know, years ago it was here, take eight hours of this and you're culturally competent. And we know that it's, that's not it. This is a journey that we're always on. So being culturally humble helps you to really listen and learn about each of your students individually, where they came from, what their story is. Um, and along with this is always really checking our own biases, looking at them, being willing to know we have them and um, having a plan to work on them, right? A plan and a support person. Always modeling compassion. You know, I read a quote once that was so powerful. It said, everybody has a story that you know nothing about. So be kind always, right? So really keeping that in mind and modeling compassion. Some of your students may have never uh, had someone who was compassionate toward them. So modeling what that looks like. Again, knowing the signs of a trauma response, remembering that flight, fight, and freeze. <clears throat> also being on the lookout for those hypervigilant kinds of behaviors and responses, and also the ones where folks are just disengaged completely. Um, on the screen here, we have safe environments, remembering we can't create a safe environment. We can create a safer environment because we don't know what the other person has experienced or what their triggers are. And it's important that if we've experienced trauma in our own lives, our own bodies, that we also know what our triggers are and also um, how to respond to those. Um, in my own trauma story, and it's a long story, I won't share it, but one part of it was um, there was some alcohol uh, related issues in my family. And what I noticed was uh, when I was assigned to a student or a family where alcohol was an issue, that was a trigger for me. So what I really had to learn early on was I wasn't the best person to work with families who um, were having issues around alcoholism until I learned to resolve some of those issues that I had around that and the trauma that I had for myself. So knowing your own triggers is really important. Um, a lot of folks uh, try to be, uh, they think establishing clear and consistent rules uh, for someone who's experienced trauma isn't a great idea, but it's actually the opposite. Folks who have not experienced um, uh, consistency in order to help resolve their trauma need some of that. It's consistency and clear, but there's also flexibility, right? Just like the principal story. Uh, we know what the rules are. We're working toward them. Um, they're consistent. We're not changing them. We're not expecting less from someone because they have experienced trauma, um, but we're giving supports and adaptations there to be helpful to them. Um, <clears throat> knowing people's individual strengths and the benefits of being a tutor is that you have folks in small groups one-on-one. -on -one. You really get to know someone. So building in activities that really help you know them even better. Anything that you can do to find out what they're interested in, building the lessons around those kind of things. Just like Julie said, she found a book uh, that the student really resonated with and was really helpful. Uh, also knowing and finding out what your students need and helping to make that happen. And sometimes those are needs beyond education, right? But just knowing what their supports are. Doing as many things you can do to accommodate and help. Um, predictability is important. A lot of folks who have experienced trauma, chaos was the norm. Chaos was the norm, and that's the only way they know to function. So I've had a lot of students in my life who, if things were calm and there wasn't chaos, they created some, right? That's a trauma response. Um, predictability and structure is important. And in relationships, in my own trauma story, I had someone who I trusted, was a trusted teacher. And I learned that she shared my story with someone else without my permission. That was a huge betrayal and a huge trauma trigger. So value your relationships. If you're gonna share something of one of your students or you're gonna ask for more supports, ask your students permission. Maybe nobody ever asked them permission before, right? Um, the last one talks about incorporating service learning. Um, service learning is really, you're probably doing some of this now, but um, 
the uh, one path, many paths to healing is, there are many paths, of course, but gratitude is one, being belonging to something, being able to contribute. So if you can build lessons around betterment of the community, uh, service to others, those are things that folks with who have a trauma response or a trauma back to, background gravitate toward and enjoy being part, can enjoy depending on where they are in their, their trauma journey. But service learning is usually around something that's meaningful. So uh, for example, I worked with a group of moms in a family literacy program once and uh, several had come from trauma that they, trauma backgrounds that they had um, shared with the group. We did uh, at least once a month, we did a service learning project. So like one I can think of is we organized a teacher appreciation day for um, the elementary school teachers that were teaching their, their, their little ones. And there's a ton of great adult education skills that you have to use, not to mention life skills and work skills that you use when you are doing service learning projects like organizing a teacher appreciation day. Um, so it wasn't just, it, it was contextualized learning in it were, it was things that they could actually see others benefiting from. So if you're not doing things with service learning, you might want to explore um, that kind of thing. Any questions on this slide before we go to the next one? It's a lot, you know, and again, we're just scratching the surface today and in our time together, but there's a lot. Hmm. Many folks um, who have trauma have felt powerless. Their power at some point was taken away from the trauma that they, uh, the way that they experienced the traumatic events or the ongoing traumatic events in their life. So anything that you can do to uh, empower them, give them choice, um, embedding some of wellness instruction into the curriculum that you're using, to the lessons that you're, you're working with. Um, keeping the high expectations, helping to build their competency, but doing it in a very, very supportive way. And if you're a coordinator or a, uh, someone who has some leadership in your program, how is your overall program building this, these kinds of things and how is it going to be more trauma uh, sensitive and informed? Collaboration is the key. You know, we're not serving the student in isolation, we're doing it as part of a bigger program. So um, the more trauma-informed approaches are being talked about across the organization, the better. So we talked about that idea of team right? So there, there's an instructor who's probably working with your student and, and other folks in the program who could help. Um, identifying triggers. A lot of times folks who are on the journey of trauma recovery and integration don't know what their triggers are. So helping them to identify it and then to do something when to know what to do to deal with that trigger is helpful. Uh, we've said relationship um, uh, several times during this hour that we've had together. Uh, having a relationship with your, your student is really important, one that's helpful and supportive, but one that also has healthy boundaries. So that will be important for you to know. And sometimes um, if we ourselves have a trauma background, sometimes healthy boundaries aren't, aren't great for us. So sometimes we overdo, we overhelp, we wanna to try to fix. So it's important that we also know ourselves and knowing that we really can't fix anyone other than ourselves for sure. Um, and uh, helping the whole family, if we have a program that's built around that where the, the family's involved, like in a family literacy program, thinking about ways to do that. And then also knowing what are the um, resources in your community, what's available for people who have, uh, who have experienced trauma. Oftentimes I would use a community pamphlet or something that I knew that my student was interested in or, or wanting to know more about. I would use the, the, the pamphlet as part of the adult education materials that we were learning adult education skills from but using it in a context that was important to them and helpful. 
We talked about this, the idea of as many choices as you can give and use choice language. Use choice language. And what you'll find with choice is initially folks who have not been given a lot of choice in their life and their power has been taken away, they oftentimes will resist choice. You offer a choice and they will say, oh, you, you just pick it. Oh, or what are your goals? Oh, I don't know. What do you think my goal should be? Um, and sometimes that comes across as resistance to us. And you know how in our minds, we, you know, we make up stories and we say things like, oh, the person doesn't care or whatever it is. I wish they cared about what they were doing. Um, they may have never been given choice. So you might want to gently give them choice a couple of times, choice with options. Um, but you can see how sometimes when we're explaining or thinking about why something happened, we're having a reason in our head that has nothing to do with the reason. Uh, collaborative problem solving is important. Giving people a, a minute or a chance to, if they're having a hard time, have an alternative for them. Or also what we're seeing in schools now are things called chill rooms, where when someone feels that they're struggling, they can go and be somewhere different. So it's helping people uh, create some options for them. Even giving the student, hey, you wanna look out the window? You wanna take a walk? What do you wanna, what can we do here? Um, important. Uh, the big thing that we want, this is like the big uh, takeaway that we wanna remember is the idea of trust and mutual respect with everyone that we're working with. And oftentimes, like and when we reflected earlier, the first thing that comes to our mind is what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, when my student didn't show up after we studied for the GED, worked super hard for that GED test, was 100% ready, would have passed, found somebody who paid for the test, got a ride to take the test, and then they didn't show up. You know, initially, the question that comes to us sometimes is, oh my gosh, what is wrong? What is wrong? Why, why are we not doing this? Um, so what I'd love for you to do, if nothing else, is when that what is wrong with you question comes to your mind about people, shifting that to what has happened to you? What has happened to the person that these are the kinds of choices that they would make? We had a mom in our program who had 13 children, six of them, who were removed from the home. So, you know, initially staff was like, what is, why, you know, we're working cl so closely with you. What is wrong? What is happening? Getting to that question about what happened to that person early on, you know, what, what is unresolved trauma there? Um, and she may have wanted 13 children and, and those kinds of things, but is there something deeper happening in there? How do we help you know, explore that? So switching it from the what's wrong with you to or what's wrong with him or her to the what happened to you. And it's just natural sometimes for us. We have the way our brain works is when something happens that we can't explain, like if we're in traffic and someone cuts us off, our brain immediately goes to what a jerk. What, what's wrong with them? They could have killed me. But when we cut someone off, the way our brain's geared, we go to, oh my gosh, I'm really late. I really have to get to where I'm going. It's called fundamental attribution error. It's a real thing. So we have to be very intentional about not saying what's wrong with the person. Why are they making those poor choices? But looking deeper to what happened, what's, what's going on? How can I set up this learning environment or my relationship with the person in a more trauma informed way. The other very important piece here is this idea about we can't teach what we don't know and you can't give away what you don't have. So it's really important that you're taking care of yourself. You're self-reflective about what you're doing. I had to do that reflective activity in the beginning. It's really important as folks who are teaching other folks, but also just as human beings, that we are constantly in the uh, self-reflection mode. What happened? What did I do that was really helpful here? What could I have done better? It just makes us all you know, better human beings. But we can, as folks in helping professions and teaching is a help profession, tutoring is helping, um, we sometimes wanna fix. 
So really understanding and taking care of ourselves and knowing that that's not possible, not possible for us to fix. I know we're running a little short on time, but I want you to revisit the learner that you thought about the example this morning. I want you to think about that and that first activity. And now with just a little tiny bit of trauma-informed care knowledge that we've been able to give you in this little hour that we've had together, is there something you would have done differently? Or when you think back to what you thought, um, knowing now that some of the behaviors come from uh, a trauma background or a trauma experience, just reflect and think, is there something that I could have done differently, would have done differently, or might do differently next time? So what I want you to do is just uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, there's a ton of resources at the end of the slide here uh, that Rachel will get you, but I have some great videos on trauma that um, help really understand how the brain and the body are working together um, and, where, and where some of these uh, behaviors come from and, and what we're seeing. Any questions? Anything in the chat there that I'm not seeing, Rachel? Uh, yeah, so Julie said uh, something that I thought was a good point here to go from the symptoms of trauma to the sources of trauma. So a lot of the times I think we see the symptoms of trauma in our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes we'll never know this source, right? And sometimes mm -hmm. they're not even sure of the source. Um, but we know that these adverse childhood experiences, a lot are embedded there, right? And as many of you are saying, you've got folks coming from all different parts of the world that we may have, we may have no sense of what they experienced, right? No. Good, thanks, good comments. Anything else? Um, Jenna asked if we could get a copy of the presentation. So yep. this is being recorded. Um, and if you go to the, um, I'll put the link in the chat again, um, but there's a website where in, I would say usually within a week, we will post the uh, recording on this website. And, um, if you go to the PD portal course, um, there's instructions also at this link for how to join that. And you'll be able to find the um, a PDF of the PowerPoint there. And here are the list of resources with, um, when you have the PowerPoint, you'll have the hot link to all these mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, if you want to read an author, um, if you want to read a book that I think is very helpful, or at least look him up on um, YouTube, Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E, is, um, I think he explains a lot of this in a way that's uh, understandable. And I'll get Rachel some, a uh, couple of the videos that I was talking about that helps the zone of tolerance and the flight fright freeze. And uh, again, thank you for the very important work that you're doing. Your students are lucky that you are in their lives and that you're interested in um, learning more to help them. So uh, good luck to uh, each of you. And I'm, I'm happy we had the opportunity just to chat for a little bit. All right, thank you again for everybody. Um, if you would like to complete the survey, that's, I just put that in the chat. And if you want any of the resources um, that Rose shared, feel free to email me as well if you can't, um, if they don't come through uh, within about a week. Um, the September webinar is going to be, um, oh shoot, Lynn, can you <laughs> share with the September webinar? Goal setting, right? Or, Lynn, you're muted. It's a good thing because my phone was ringing too. <laughs> um, it's on goal setting, helping yeah. students set goals and set goals in the classroom. So it's not necessarily mm -hmm. goal setting outside of the class, but how they can set goals while they're working with you and move forward. Yeah. Yep. Great. So yeah, we'll, Rachel knows we'll how to get a hold. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say Rachel knows how to get a hold of me if anybody wants to chat further. Yeah. We'll look forward to seeing you all in the fall. <laughs> all right.
All right. Bye.